Now I call upon Dr. William Campbell to present his response to Dr. Zakir Naik. Well, Dr. Naik has brought up some real problems. <laughs> I don't agree with his answer about the Koran in terms of the Alaka and Mudaka. I still think it's a big problem. But that's his opinion and my opinion. So everybody will have to go home and think about it themselves. He spoke about he hasn't mentioned, met any person that took the poison test. I can't present the person because he's already gone to be with the Lord, but I have friend Harry Radcliffe. And he lived in a town in the south of Morocco. And one of his people who he thought was a friend invited him over for a lunch, for a dinner. And he invited the, the, the wife and son also. And so when Harry agreed to go, somebody came and knocked on the door and said, the man's going to poison you. So they went. Harry took this very verse that you've read, and he decided that he should go because he had said he would. So he went. He waited, hoping to find a time when, when the man brought in the couscous, he could turn, the man would go out and he could turn the couscous around. But there was no such time. So he dug in and he ate. His wife was too, she wasn't able to eat very much, and they had fed their son before they went. But Harry ate. And that night, Harry got pains in his tummy. And he had some blood. But he lived. And so two days later, he went and knocked on the door. And the man came and opened the door, and his face went absolutely white. And Harry thanked him for the meal. I thought, so I give you this one example anyway. Now you have said about Jesus was only sent to the Jews. Go only go to the, to the Jews to, and not to the Gentiles. Well, in the Koran itself, it talks about Mary. And then she says, I don't know any man. In Sora 1921, and then it says that Jesus is to be a sign unto man and a mercy from us. In Matthew 4, 9, a lady came and anointed Jesus' feet. He said, Whenever there, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told. And in Matthew 28, when Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, this is not a contradiction. He did say to his disciples, go only to the Jews, because the Jews were given a certain chance. There's a story in the Bible. I shouldn't use a story, word story, I suppose, but history, where Jesus came to a fig tree. And the fig tree had brought no fruit for three years. And so then the, he said, shall I tear it down? And then Jesus' answer was, no, leave it one more year and we'll fertilize it and see if it brings any fruit. This was all a parable about Israel. He had preached to them three years and he would preach another half. But then there are other parables that he told where he said, all right, it'll be taken away from you, the blessing and given to the Gentiles. Dr. Nike has talked about the day and the periods. The day in the Bible also can have the time of a long period. It doesn't have to be 24 hours, as Dr. Bukai wanted to exist in his book. And I believe that it was, was long periods of time. 
And there are some of these problems that he has said, and I don't deny them, and I don't have good answers for them. But I will tell about... <laughs> he spoke about the, the two kinds of salt the sweet water and the salt water. I don't agree with his explanation. The Koran says has, that God has let free the two barriers, two bodies of flowing water meeting together. Between them is a barrier which they do not transgress. Then which of the fairy favors of your Lord will you deny? The word used here for barrier is barzakh means interval, or gap, or break, or bar, or obstruction, or isthmus. The same information is given in El Furqan 2553. It is he who has let free the two bodies of flooring, flowing water, one palatable, palatable and sweet, and the other salty and bitter. And he made between them a barrier and a partition that it is forbidden to pass. The phrase, a partition that it is forbidden to pass, represents two words from the same root. This is done in Arabic to stress or accent whatever is being discussed. The word hijr means forbidden, interdicted, prohibited, all very strong words. And the second word, which is the last participle of the verb, has the same, past participle of the verb, has the same meanings. Therefore, very literally, one might translate this as he, God, made between them a bar and a forbidden forbidding. Dr. Bukai discusses this briefly, and then he, he says, though he admits at the end, well, it mixes far out to sea. A scientist friend commenting on this said, it is simply that the salt and fresh water are physically separated. The effluent from the river displacing the seawater, but there is no barrier. Thermodynamically, the mixing is a spontaneous, immediate process, highly favored by entropy. The only barrier is kinetic. It takes a long time for that much stuff to mix. I myself have, been, have had a tiny example of this. I had a friend in Tunisia, and he used to, collect, he used to hunt for, for, for octopi. So I went there once, and I jumped out of the boat and was swimming around. And it was right at the, at the, where our small creek came in. And the, the top water was cold and the bottom water was hot. I thought, how can this be? The top is cold and the bottom is hot. And then I realized the cold water was coming off of the, of, out of the river. And the salt water is heavy. So the wa salt warm water was on the bottom and the cold light water was at the top. So there is, but there is no barrier. Dr. S uh, Nike spoke about languages, and of course, I am not able to answer about the languages in in India. Well, I couldn't answer about the Indian languages in America either, so it's no different between India and America. However, the place that he talks about in the Bible, the disciples were given languages as a miracle, but they were the languages that the people who were there knew. They weren't weak languages that were unknown. If somebody came from Spain, an apostle spoke to that person in his language from Spain. If another person came from Turkey, a different apostle spoke to the other person in his language from Turkey. I'm going to go to something that I've prepared to give and talk about witnesses. In Deuteronomy, God told Moses the way to know true prophet was did his prophecy come true? Elijah is an example, Elias in the Quran. And he went to the king and he told him, it's not going to rain till I say so. 
And so it was six months and no rain. A year and no rain. Once in Tunisia, there was a whole year with no rain. Then two years with no rain. And three years. And three and a half years. And then Elijah went to the king. And he said, we're going to have a contest. And they went up on Mount Carmel and they had this contest. And the king lost. And in the Koran, it says that Elias had a major, wonderful victory. But then Elias fell down on his knees, Elijah, and he prayed for rain. And the rain came. Well, Elijah's the first witness. When he said, it's not going to rain till I say so, he was the first witness. When God made the rain come, when Elijah fell down on his knees, God himself was the second witness. Another example is Isaiah 750 B.C. The Jews were sent into exile. He prophesied they'd be sent to exile. And then Cyrus would bring them back. Cyrus, who's Cyrus? 250 years later, Cyrus, a Persian pagan king, sent the Jews back to Israel, back to Palestine. And there's a Cyrus cylinder in London that talks about it. So we're going to ask the question, did Jesus fulfill prophecies? Did Jesus do miracles? Did Jesus make prophecies? We're going to make a mathematical study of prophecies. It's called the theory of probabilities. Estimate and will estimate the possibility that these prophecies could be fulfilled by chance. An example of this is supposing Dr. Nike has 10 shirts. And he, I know he has a red shirt. And I say, tomorrow he's going to wear the red shirt. And tomorrow he does. And so then I say, I'm a prophet. Well, my friends are going to say, no, no, that just happened by chance. Well, then, supposing Dr. Samuel Naaman, he has two pairs of shoes and a pair of sandals. So then the next day, I prophesy what shirt that Dr. Nike is going to wear, and I practice, prophesy that Dr. Samuel Naaman is going to wear his sandals. And Dr. Zabil Ahmed, he has five hats, and I say he's going to wear his turban. Well, what are the chances that I could have all of these right by chance? Oh, it's gone away. Anyway, all right, you multiply 1 over 10 by 1 over 5 by 1 over 3, and you get 1 over 150. And that's my chance of getting it by luck. Is it possible to have the slide projector down, please? I mean, the, the uh, screen down. Well, the time is going, and we're going to look at tw 10 prophecies. And then one, which we will not count because it's what we want to prove. The first one is a prophecy in Jeremiah, prophecy in Jeremiah 600 B.C. that the Messiah must be from the posterity of David. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. He will be called the Lord Yahweh, our righteousness. And the fulfillment was in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to Mary. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. He will be called Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called holy. Well, when David was first, he was just from a small family. But after he became king and his family was known, then everybody would remember if they were the fifth cousin of the king. So I'm going to assume that one in 200 Jewish people belong to the family of David. The second prophecy 
is an everlasting ruler to be born in Bethlehem. Micah 750 B.C. But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. And the fulfillment, though Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth, because of an order from Caesar Augustus, Joseph had to take Mary to Bethlehem, his native town. In the fulfillment, it says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And while there, she gave birth to her firstborn son. Well, what's the chance of being born in Bethlehem? There's about two million, two billion people were, were born in the world from Micah until now. And 7,000 live in Bethlehem. So one man out of every 280,000 men was born in Bethlehem. The third prophecy, a messenger will prepare the way for the Messiah. This was done by Malachi in chapter 3, 1 and 400 B.C. Behold, I send my message to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant is whom you delight, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The fulfillment, the next day John, John the Baptist, Yahweh ibn Zechariah, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. And to this the Koran agrees also in the story of the family of Imran, 339-45, when it says that Yahya is to come, witnessing the truth of a word from God, whose name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. Well, how many leaders had a forerunner? Well, that's hard to say. But when I put down one man in a thousand was a leader who had a forerunner. Fourth prophecy, the Messiah will do many signs and miracles. In Isaiah 7:50, we read, Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong and do not fear. Your God will come and he will save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb shout for joy. The fulfillment. The gospel states, as does the Koran, that Jesus did many miracles. The Bible speaks of only four prophets who did many miracles. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus. Jesus is the only one that did all four types of miracles mentioned in the prophecy. And he sometimes healed all who came to him. Well, since many Muslims believe there were 124,000 prophets, we will use that number and say that Jesus was the one man in 124,000. The fifth prophecy. In spite of these signs, his brothers were against him. In the Psalm of David, 1000 B.C., he says, I have come, become a stranger to my brethren, an alien to my mother's sons. And in John, he gives the fulfillment. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Our question might be, one ruler and how many would have find his family against him? Well, many kings were overthrown by their own relatives. Therefore, we will say one in five, or two times ten to the first power. And the sixth prophecy. It's given by Zechariah in 520 B.C. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass. The fulfillment. The next day, the great crowd took some palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. Well, obviously, Jesus chose to sit upon the donkey. That's no miracle. It's nothing unusual. But the crowd was there, and the crowd came and, and uh, praised him and said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, how many rulers entered Jerusalem? How many rulers entered Jerusalem on a donkey? 
Nowadays, he'd come on a mer in a Mercedes. But one roller, I said one ruler in a hundred. The seventh prophecy, Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. He himself gave the prophecy. So Jesus said this in sometime in 30 A.D. And as Jesus was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. In the fulfillment, about 40 years later in 70 A.D., the Roman general Titus captured Jerusalem after a long siege. Titus had intended to spare the temple, but the Jews set it on fire. Well, for the Jews to revolt and then be crushed would be common. So I said, one chance in five. For the eighth prophecy, the Messiah will be crucified. In Psalms, David wrote, 1000 B.C., a band of evil men has, has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Well, Jesus, David didn't die this way. He died in his bed. His feet, were not hand, or his feet and hands were not pierced. Luke gives us the fulfillment. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified Jesus along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Our question is, one man and how many has been crucified? Well, I said one man in 10,000. The prophecy, nine, they will divide his garments and cast lot for his robe. Again, this is David speaking. They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Well, John gives us the fulfillment in chapter 19. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said. Let's decide by lot who will get it. Well, how many cr criminals would have a seamless garment? Well, you can make your own dis decision, but I said one in a hundred. The 10th prophecy, though innocent, he would be counted with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Isaiah said in 750 B.C. he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He was numbered with the transgressors. Matthew gives us the fulfillment. They crucified two robbers with him. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Joseph wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own tomb. Well, how many executed criminals were innocent? Well, I said one man in ten. And how many innocent men or how many criminals were buried with the rich? I said one man in a hundred. That gives one in a thousand. Finally, the prophecy, after dying, he will rise from the dead. In Isaiah, again, it says, for he was cut off from the land of the living. He died. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. So there is a, there is a prophecy that he will be, come back to life. Luke tells us Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And then... Paul gives us a summary in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Then to James, Jesus' half-brother. Then to all the apostles. Well, that's not something you can give a value to. So now we're going to look at the calculation. One man and how many men the world over will fulfill all ten prophecies? This question can be answered by multiplying all of our estimates. I don't have time to read them, but the answer is one chance in two times, 2.78 times 10 to the 28, 28 zeros. Let us simplify and reduce the number by calling it one times 10 to the 28. 
The best information available indicates the number of men who ever lived to be about 88 billion. We'll call that 1 times 10 to the 11th. By dividing these two numbers, we find that the chance that any man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled all 10 prophecies by luck is 1 in 10 to the 17th. That's written out this way with 17 zeros. Well, let's try and imagine this. If you took the state of Texas and you covered it with dollar coins, one meter deep, three feet deep, silver dollars, and then one coin was marked electrically, and then I say, there, go walk out into the state of Texas and pick the right coin. That's your chance of picking the right coin by chance. In other words, it's no chance. I'm having trouble. Just a minute. There are many more prophecies. These all show the prophet David or Isaiah, Isaiah as the first witness. God causing fulfillment is the second witness. And God caused the disciples of Jesus to write it down. These are all proofs that the Bible is true and from Yahweh Elohim. The gospel says that Jesus came from God and paid the penalty for our sins. This is good news. The Koran has hard news. Surah Nahal 1661 says, If a law were to punish men for their wrongdoing, he would not leave on earth a single living creature. The problem is that the Koran states very clear that even those who have done their best are given only a maybe. In the surah of their narration, al qasas it says, But as for him who shall repent and believe and do right, Perhaps, as I am, he may be one of the successful. In the forbidding, at Taharim, it says, O you who believe, repent toward Allah with a sincere repentance. It may be that your Lord will repent from you your evil do deeds. In the Surah of Repentance, at Tawbah, it says, Those only shall worship in the mosques of Allah who believe in Allah on the last day and observe proper worship and give alms and fear none except Allah, and it might be that these are of the rightly guided. In the end, it's very lonely. If a person does not believe, then he's sure to go to hell. But if he does believe on the day of judgment, he stands there all by himself in front of Allah. There is no intercessor or friend, and he can only hope that maybe, perhaps, he might be among the blessed. This is hard news. Where in his dictionary translates Asayan as it might be, it could be that, possibly, maybe, perhaps. In the Oxford Dictionary, it's English, English Arabic, perhaps, is translated as Asayan. This may be true, but it's hard. On the other hand, the Gospel has good news. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve to give my life a ransom for many. Another verse from Paul the Apostle says, If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Straight out. <laughs> this is wonderful good news. You read with me these fulfilled prophecies as proofs. There were 500 people who saw Christ after he rose from the dead. There are many archaeological finds confirm the Bible. I urge you, get a copy of the Bible, of the Gospel, read it. You will find good news for your soul. May God bless you all. Thank you. I now call upon Dr. Zakir Naik to present his response to Dr. William Campbell. Alhamdulillah, was salatu was salam, ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain, amma baad. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'ana, walau qana min indi gairillah, lawajudu fi iktilafin kafirah. Bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yassir li yamri, wa halul ugdatan min lisani yafkahu kawli. Respected Dr. William Campbell, 
the other people on the dais, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you once again with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Almighty God be on all of you. Dr. William Campbell only touched on two out of the 22 points I made, only two. <laughs> the first point it is, was he thinks that the days mentioned in the Bible, he refers to as long periods. I already gave the reply in my talk that if you consider the days to be long period like the Quran, you can only solve two problems. The six day creation problem and first day light came and third day earth. But the remaining four problems yet is there. So Dr. William Campbell chose to say days are long period and out of six he solved two scientific errors. The remaining four of the creation of the universe, he does agree to it. That's good. And he says it's difficult to answer. The second point he touched on was regarding the scientific test of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 17 and 18. And he said one of his friends by the name of Harry, what was the name was, in Morocco, in Morocco, he ate couscous. <laughs> the Bible says, the King James Version as well as the New International Version, which Dr. William Campbell refers to, drink deadly poison, not eat, drink. Yet, yet, I don't mind, even a person eats deadly poison also, no problem. But imagine one man in Morocco, I am told there are two billion Christians in the world. No one can come forward, not one out of the two billion. And I thought Dr. William Campbell was a true Christian believer, and I asked him to pass the test, not his friend who already died. <laughs> and he said that blood came out of the mouth. Dr. William Campbell, and even I know very well, being medical doctors, that having poison, blood comes out, and we cure many people of poison, so what's so great? Test is, they should come forward and do all these things, and yet, you should be able to speak foreign tongues. And Dr. William Campbell said, that, at that time, if you read Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, those people there, they spoke the languages people knew, and foreign tongues. Dr. William Campbell doesn't know there are Indians out here. Surely many know Gujarati, Marathi, even I know. If I ask you, <laughs> suppose if I ask you, if I ask in a particular language, Nirgut, Nirgut Tamil, no reply. Foreign tongues, Nirgut, anyone knows Tamil? Or Malayalam, Velam? Yes, very good. Are you a Christian believer? Are you? I'm asking that person there. You are a Muslim? Anyway, fine. This was supposed to be a test passed by Christian believers. There are many people in foreign languages out here. Only thing you have to do was speak to them. Like, what is your name? How are you? For example, I look an Arabic, which you know. New languages, which you didn't know. And you proved my point. And yet I have not come across a single Christian who has passed the test in front of me. Not a single. Out of the thousands I've met personally. And now it can be thousand and one after meeting Dr. William Campbell. Only touch two points. Dr. William Campbell did not reply to my 20 points and he started speaking about prophecy. What has prophecy to do with science in the Bible? If prophecy is the test, if prophecy is the test, then Nostradamus' book should be the best book. Nostradamus' book should be the best book to be called the Word of God. It is not. He spoke about theory of probability. For the definition of theory of probability, how you can analyze with the Quran, with scientific facts, refer to my video cassette, is the Quran God's word? It's available in the fire. I prove scientifically how can you use theory of probability. Dr. William Campbell used it on the base of prophecy. If I want, I can try and prove his prophecy wrong. I don't want to do it. I take it for granted for sake of argument, using the concordance approach that whatever prophecy he said was right, for sake of argument. But even if there's one unfulfilled prophecy, the whole Bible is disproved with the word of God. 
I can give you a list of unfulfilled prophecy. For example, if you read Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 12, it says, God told Cain, you will never be able to settle. You will be a wanderer. Few verses later on, Genesis chapter 4, verse 17 says, Cain built up a city. Unfulfilled prophecy. If you read Jeremiah chapter number 36, verse number 30, it says that Jehoiakim, the father of Jehoiachin, no one will be able to sit on his throne. The throne of David, no one will be able to sit after Jehoiakim. If you read later on 2 Kings chapter number 24, verse number 6, it says that Jehoiakim, after he died, later on Jehoiachin sat on the throne. Unfulfilled prophecy. One is sufficient to prove it's not the word of God. I can give plenty. If you read Ezekiel chapter number 26, it says that Nebuchadnezzar, he will destroy Tyre. We come to know that Alexander the Great was the person who destroyed Tyre. Unfulfilled prophecy. Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14 says, prophesying of the coming of a person who will be born to a virgin, his name shall be Emmanuel. They say, the Christians, it refers to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Born to a virgin, the Hebrew word there is Amla, which means not a virgin, a young lady. The word for virgin in Hebrew is Bethula, which is not there. Even if we agree, we are using concordance. We agree. Virgin. Virgin, no problem. It says, he will be called Emmanuel. Nowhere in the Bible is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is called as Emmanuel. Unfulfilled prophecy. I can give several, plenty unfulfilled prophecy. One is sufficient to prove the Bible wrong. I have given a few. According to your theory of, theory of probability, Bible is not the word of God. But yeah. William Campbell said, that according to the Quran, Elijah won the battle, according to the Bible, Elijah lost the battle, whatever it is. That doesn't mean that Bible is correct and Quran is wrong. If the statements differ in the Bible and the Quran, you are assuming Bible is the word of God. If both are supposed to be analyzed, it can be possible that Quran is right and Bible is wrong. It can be possible Bible is right and Quran is wrong. It can be possible both are wrong. It can be possible both are right. So what we have to do, if we have to analyze which of the two is wrong, we have to get a third source from outside, which is authentic. Just because Bible says Elijah lost and Quran says Elijah won, therefore Quran is wrong, is illogical. And Dr. William Campbell, besides replying to the scientific errors I mentioned, I'll just touch on the point which I could not, due to lack of time, there are an additional six or seven points, which he mentioned in his talk, which, inshallah, I'll give the reply briefly. He spoke that the Quran says, according to me, and he showed my cassette, according to Brother Shabir Ali, that the light of the moon is reflected light, and he said it doesn't mean that. I'm quoting, again, the Quran mentions in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 61, that blessed is he who has placed in the sky constellation, placed therein lamp, sun, and moon having borrowed light. Munir, Arabic word used for moon is kamar. It's always described as munir or nur, meaning reflection of light. Reflection of light. Arabic word used for sun is shams. It's always described as wahaj diya, which means a blazing torch, a shining glory. And I can give references to the new chapter number 71, Verse 15 and 16, Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 5, and so on. And he said that if it means a reflection of light, and he quoted the Quran, Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 35 and 36, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Nur Samawati wa is the light of the heaven and the earth. Read the complete verse. And analyze what does it say? It says Allah is the light, Nur. It says, Allah is the light of the heaven and the earth. It is a similitude like a niche. And within the niche, there is lamp. The lamp word is there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got light of its own and even reflected light. Like you see a halogen lamp, you know which I hear. The lamp inside is like a siraj, but the reflector is like moon. It is reflecting light. The lamp, the tube, the tube is having a light of its own, but the reflector of the halogen lamp is reflecting light, so both two in one. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, besides having light of its own, as the Quranic verse says, in the niche there is a lamp. And that lamp light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is its own light. And Allah reflects his own light. Dr. William Campbell says that the Quran says that Quran is nur. 
is reflecting light. Of course, the Quran is reflecting the light and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Siraj, yes he is. The hadith of the beloved Prophet is giving guidance to us. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also Nur, he is also Siraj, alhamdulillah. He has his own knowledge also, alhamdulillah. He has the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah. So if you use this word Nur as reflected light and Munir as reflected light, yet alhamdulillah, you can prove it scientifically that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is the reflected light. The other points that William Campbell raised was regarding Surah Kahaf, chapter number 18, verse number 86, that Zulkar name sees the sun setting in murky water, in turbid water. Imagine sun setting in murky water, unscientific. The Arabic word used here is, it is wajada, meaning it appeared to Zulkarnain. And not William Campbell knows Arabic. But wajada means, if you look up in the dictionary also, it means it appeared. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing what appeared to Zulkarnain. If I make a statement that the student in the class said 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. And you say, oh, Zakir said 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. I didn't say. I'm telling the student in my class said 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. I'm not wrong, the student is wrong. There are various ways to try and analyze this verse. One is this way, according to Muhammad Asad, that Wajada means it appeared to, it appeared to Zulkar Nain. Point number two. The Arabic word used is Maghrib. It can be used for time as well as place. When we say sunset, Sunset can be taken for time. If I say the sun sets at 7 p.m., I'm using it for time. If I say the sun sets in the west, it means I'm taking it for place. So here if you use the word Maghrib for time, so Zulkar Nain not reach that place of sunset, use it at time. He reached at the time of sunset. The problem is solved. Furthermore, you can solve it in various ways. Even if Dr. William Campbell says, no, no, the basic assumption is too much. It is not appeared to, it is actually this. Let's analyze it further. The Quranic verse says, the sun set in murky water. Now we know, when we use these words, like sunrise and sunset, does the sun rise? Scientifically, sun does not rise. Neither does the sun set. We know scientifically the sun does not set at all. It is the rotation of the earth which gives rise to sunrise and sunset. But yet, you read in the everyday papers, Mentioning sunrise at 6 a.m., sunset at 7 p.m. Oh, the newspapers are wrong, unscientific. <laughs> if I use the word disaster, oh, there's a disaster. Disaster means there's some calamity which has taken place. Literally, disaster means an evil star. So when I say this disaster, everyone knows what I mean is a calamity, not about the evil star. Dr. William Campbell and I know. When a person who's mad, we call him a lunatic. Yes or no? At least I do. And I believe Dr. William Campbell also will be doing that. We call a person a lunatic. He's mad. What is the meaning of lunatic? It means struck by the moon. But that is how the language has evolved. Similarly, sunrise is actually, it is just a usage of word. And Allah has given the guidance for the human beings also. He uses it so that we understand. So it is just... Sunrise, not that it is actually setting, not that the sun is actually rising. So this explanation clearly gives us a clear picture that the verse of the Quran of Surah Kahaf, chapter 18, verse number 86, is not in contradiction with established science. That is the way how people speak. He quoted Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 45, 46, that the shadow lengthens and prolongates. We can make it stationary. The sun is its guide. And in his book he mentions, does the sun move? Where does this verse say the sun moves? In Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 45, 46, doesn't say the sun moves. And he writes in his book, we were taught in elementary school, and he said that also in his talk, that it is due to the rotation of the earth that the shadow prolongs and gets small. But what the Quran says, the sun is its guide. Today, even a person who has not gone to school knows that shadow is due to sunlight. Even a lay man who has not gone to school knows that shadow is due to sunlight. So Quran is perfectly right. It doesn't say the sun moves and the shadow is caused. He is putting his own words in the Quran. 
sun is its guide. It's guiding the shadow. Without sunlight, you cannot have shadow. Yes, you can have shadows of the light. It's a different thing. But here is referring to the shadow which you see, which is moving, prolonging and becoming short. Sir William Campbell spoke about Solomon's death. Surah Sabah, chapter 34, verse number 12 to 14, and said that, imagine a person standing on the stick and he dies and no one comes to know, etc. There are various ways to explain. Point number one, Solomon, peace be upon him. He was a prophet of God. And it can be a miracle. When Bible says that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, could give life to the dead. Jesus Christ is born of a virgin birth, which is more difficult to imagine. Being born of a virgin birth, giving life to the dead, or standing on a stick for a very long time. Which is more difficult? So when God can do miracles through Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, why can't he do a miracle through Solomon and Salam? Musa and Salam parted the sea. He threw a stick, stick became snake. Bible says that, Quran says that. So when God can do that, why can't God let a man rest for a long period? Anyway, I give him various different answers. Nowhere does the Quran say that Suleiman and Salam rested on the stick for a very long period. Nowhere does it say. It just says that animal, maybe some say ant, maybe other animal of the earth came and bit. Maybe possible, maybe, that Suleiman and Salam was just dead. And any animal may have shook the stick and Suleiman Islam may have fallen down. But I assume I use the conflict approach with the Quran. Because irrespective of whether you use the conflict approach or the concordance approach, the ayah I quoted in the beginning of my talk, Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 82 says, Afala is the Burun al Quran, Walla Kana min in the Gerilla, Lavajudi Fiktilaf and Kasira. Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. Irrespective whether you use the conflict approach or the concordance approach, if you are logical, you will not be able to take out a single verse of the Quran which is contradicting, neither a single verse which is against established science. I agree with Dr. William Campbell that Suleiman Salam stayed for a long time. The answer is given the same verse that after Suleiman Salam fell down, the jinn said that if you would have known that Solomon, peace be upon him, died, we wouldn't have toiled so hard, indicating that even the jinns don't have ilme gab, they don't have knowledge of the unseen. Because the jinn thought themselves to be very great. So Allah is teaching them that even they don't have ilme gab. Dr. William Campbell touched on the production of milk in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66. The first person who told about the circulation of blood was in Nafis, 600 years after the revelation of the Quran. And 400 years after the Nafis, William Harvey made it come into the Western world. That's 1000 years after the revelation of the glorious Quran. The food you eat go into the intestine, and from the intestine, the food constituents reach the various organs via the bloodstream, many a time via the poultry system of liver. And it even reaches the mammary gland, which is responsible for production of the milk. And Quran gives this information of modern science in a nutshell in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 66, where it says that verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink from what is within the body. Coming from a conjunction between the constituent of the intestine and blood, milk, which is pure for you to have. Alhamdulillah, what we came to know recently, just recently in science means, 50 years back, 100 years back. Quran mentions this information 400 years ago and repeats this message in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 21. But William Campbell raised the point about animal living in community. The Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 38, we have created every animal that lives on the earth and every bird that flies in the air to live in communities like you. And Brother William Campbell says that, you know, the spider kills the mate and, and the father, etc. Do we kill? And the lion does that, an elephant does that. He is talking about the behavior. The Quran is not referring to behavior. If Dr. William Campbell cannot understand the Quran, that does not mean Quran is wrong. The Quran says they live in communities, talking about the animals and the birds live in groups, in societies. 
like the human being. It's not talking about behavior. And today science tells that all the animals, the birds and the living creatures of the world, they live in communities. Like the human being, they live together. And I didn't have time to touch on all the points on embryology. I've touched on all of the eight, nine topics which he spoke on. Embryology, I'll go more in detail. The points he raised in embryology, besides the one I clarified in my talk, he said that the stages of development were mentioned by Hippocrates and by Galen. And he showed the various slides. The point to be noted, just because someone says some things which are matching with the Quran, that doesn't mean that Quran has been copied from that. Suppose I make a statement, suppose, if I make a statement, which is correct, which was said by somebody else earlier, that doesn't mean I have copied. It may be, it may not be. To use the conflict approach with the Quran, yes, he copied. Okay, fine. But let's analyze the Quran doesn't take the things which were wrong from Hippocrates. If you would have copied, you would have copied everything. It is logical. Unless he is a scientist, okay, this is correct. Oh, this is wrong. I won't copy that. This is correct. I'll copy that. All the stages of Hippocrates and Galen is not the same as the Quran. Hippocrates and Galen doesn't speak about leech-like substance. They don't speak about mudga at all. Where do they speak? Hippocrates and Galen at that time they said that even the women have got semen. Who says that? Even the Bible says that. If you read in the Bible, it mentions in Leviticus chapter number 12, verse number 1 to 2, that women give out seed. So actually Bible is copying from Hippocrates. And Bible says in Job, Bible says in Job chapter number 10, verse number 9 and 10, that we have made the human beings from clay, like poured out milk and curdled cheese. Poured out milk and curdled cheese is exact plagiarization from Hippocrates. Why plagiarization? Because surely that's not the word of God. That portion is unscientific. It was said by Hippocrates and Galen, the Greeks, that human beings are created like curdled cheese. And Bible copies that exactly. But Quran, Alhamdulillah, as if you analyze and read the books of embryology, even of Dr. Keith Moore, he said that Hippocrates and the other people like Galen, etc., they did give a lot of things to embryology initially, as well as Aristotle. Many were right, many were wrong. And further he goes to say, in the Middle Ages, or at the time of the Arabs, the Quran speaks about something additional. If it was exactly copied, why would Dr. Keith Moore in his book give due credit to the Quran? He even gives due credit to Aristotle, to Hippocrates, but mentions there, many were wrong. That he doesn't mention with the Quran. That is enough proof that Quran wasn't copied from the Greek time. <laughs> Regarding light of the moon, light of the moon was copied from Greeks. You will tell me that the world is spherical was copied from Greek. I know the Pythagoras, the Greeks, lived in 6th century BC who believed that the earth rotated. They believed that the sunlight was reflected. If Prophet Muhammad Nauz Billah copied, why didn't he copy? They believed the sun was stationary. They believed sun was the center of the universe. So why did Prophet Muhammad copy the correct thing and delete the thing which were not correct? This is sufficient proof that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not copy. He goes to give a list that from Greek to Syriac, Syriac to Arabic, and big research. One statement of the Quran is sufficient to disprove it. The Quran says in Surah an kabut chapter 29, verse number 48, that thou was not able to recite any book before this, nor was thou able to transcribe with the right hand. If it was so, the talkers of vanity would have surely doubted. The Prophet was an ummi. He was an illiterate. This fact of history is sufficient to prove that he didn't plagiarize from anywhere. Enough! Imagine! Even a scientist who is very literate cannot do this thing. But Allah in His divine guidance made the last prophet as an ummi so that the talkers of vanities, like people who write books against Islam, they cannot open their mouths. The prophet was ummi. There are various things that I can continue speaking about the Bible. I have covered up all his arguments against Quran. Alhamdulillah, not a single point to prove Quran is against science. He has not touched on 22 points of mine, touched on two, 
not proven. So all 22 yet prove that Bible is incompatible with modern science. Point number 23, in the field of zoology, in the field of zoology, it is mentioned in Leviticus chapter number 11, verse number 6, that hair is a cut chewer. We know that hair doesn't shoot cut. Previously, people thought by the movement of the hair. Now we know hair is not a cut chewer, neither does it have a compartmentalized stomach. It's mentioned in the Proverbs, chapter number 6, verse number 7, that ant has got no ruler, no seer, no chief. Today we know that ants are sophisticated insects. They have a very good system of labor in which they have chief, they have foreman, they have workers, they even have queen, they even have a ruler. Therefore, Bible is unscientific. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, and Isaiah chapter 65, verse number 25, that serpents eat dust. No zoological book says serpents eat dust. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 20, among the abomination things, fowls with four feet. They are an abomination. And some scholars say that fowl is the wrong translation of the Hebrew word oof. In King James, it should be insect or winged creature. And in New International Version, it says winged creature. But it says all insects which are four-footed are an abomination. They are detestable for you. I want to ask Dr. William Campbell, which insects have got four feet? Even a student who has passed elementary school knows that insects have got six feet. There is no bird in the world, there is no fowl in the world, there is no insect in the world which has got four feet. Furthermore, there are mythical animals and fabulous animals mentioned in the Bible as though they exist. For example, unicorn. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse number 7, talking about unicorn. As though it exists, you look up in the dictionary, it says the animal which has got a horse's body and a horn, which is only available in myths. My time is over. Only I like to tell that I apologize if I've hurt the feelings of any Christians. That was not my intention. It was just a reply to Dr. William Campbell's book to prove that Quran is compatible with science and Bible, though portions we do consider maybe the word of God, completely not the word of God. It's not in conciliation. And I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Isra chapter 17, verse 81, which says, Wakul jal haq wa zakal batil. When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish.